Hey everyone and welcome back to our ultrasound physics lessons. Today's video, we will cover the interaction of sound and media. Let's dive in. So as sound waves travel through a medium, they lose their energy or basically weaken through a process known as attenuation. Now there are actually two factors that influence attenuation. That's distance and the frequency of sound. Let's break it down. So imagine you're on a hike in the woods. The further you hike through branches, undergrowth, and uneven terrain, you begin to lose energy and become more tired. This same concept can be applied to sound waves. See, distance and attenuation are directly related. This means that an increase in distance results in an increase in attenuation. The further that sound travels, the weaker it becomes. Now, another key relationship exists between frequency and attenuation. Like with distance, frequency and attenuation are directly related. So higher frequency sounds are going to result in more attenuation, On lower frequency sounds will result in less attenuation. Now, as we explore the concept of attenuation in ultrasound imaging, we need to understand the three processes that contribute to this phenomenon, and that's reflection, scattering, and absorption. Let's begin with reflection. So reflection occurs when sound waves strike a boundary and some of its energy is reflected back to the ultrasound system. So similar to how light reflects off a mirror, sound waves bounce back when they encounter tissue boundaries in the body. This is what leads to echoes in ultrasound imaging, helping to create a beautiful image. Now here's where attenuation comes into play. As sound waves reflect off tissue boundaries, some of their energy is absorbed and they lose their intensity. This loss of energy contributes to attenuation, reducing the overall strength of the ultrasound signal as it travels deeper into the body. Now reflection can be categorized into two main types, specular and diffuse. Now specular reflection occurs when sound waves encounter a smooth boundary and this results in clear, well-defined echoes. Now an example of specular reflection is like shining a flashlight onto a flat, reflective surface. The light is going to bounce off the surface in one specific direction, creating a distinct, organized reflection. Similarly, in ultrasound imaging, specular reflection produces clear, sharply defined echoes when the sound waves strike a smooth boundary. Now, on the other hand, diffuse reflection occurs when sound waves encounter a rough or irregular boundary. So instead of bouncing off in one single and organized direction, the sound waves are actually going to scatter in various directions, resulting in a diffuse pattern of echoes. Now let's talk about the next factor that contributes to attenuation. Scattering occurs when sound waves encounter small, irregular structures within the medium, like cells or particles. And with scattering, the sound will be redirected in various directions, all contributing to attenuation. Now, remember I said that higher frequencies experience more attenuation? Here's one reason why. Higher frequency sound waves are more susceptible to scattering when compared to lower frequency waves. Therefore, frequency and scattering are directly related. Now let's dive into a special type of scattering known as Rayleigh scattering. Now this type of scattering occurs when sound waves encounter particles or structures that are smaller than the wavelength of the sound wave. In clinical imaging, Rayleigh scattering is typically seen when ultrasound interacts with red blood cells. And a key point to note is that Rayleigh scattering leads to the dispersion of sound waves equally in multiple directions, contributing to a loss of energy and attenuation. And just like regular scattering, Rayleigh scattering is directly related to frequency. However, Rayleigh scattering is actually related to frequency to the power of four. In other words, as the frequency of the sound wave increases, the amount of Rayleigh scattering increases exponentially. 
Like for example, if the frequency doubled or increased by a factor of two, the amount of really scattering would be 16 times greater. And this is because two to the power of four is equal to 16. Now let's dive into absorption, the final process contributing to attenuation. And absorption occurs when sound waves transfer their energy to the medium that they're passing through, resulting in a decrease in intensity as the waves penetrate deeper into the tissue. To understand absorption, let's consider a sponge soaking up water. And just as the sponge absorbs water and becomes saturated, tissues in the body absorb sound waves and dissipate their energy as heat. And a key thing to note is that absorption is directly related to frequency. The higher the frequency, the more attenuation that occurs due to the high rate of absorption. Now, while we focused on attenuation in soft tissue so far, it's important to understand that attenuation also occurs in other types of media encountered in ultrasound imaging. So let's explore how attenuation varies in different media and its implications for diagnostic imaging. So biologic fluids such as blood or urine are known to have low attenuation rates when compared to soft tissue. This is because fluids contain fewer obstacles or structures for sound waves to interact with. And because fluids have very low attenuation rates, they act as excellent acoustic windows in ultrasound imaging. See, when we image a fluid-filled structure, such as the urinary bladder or a cyst, the sound waves encounter minimal scattering and absorption as they pass through the fluid. This allows the sound waves to penetrate deeply into the structure and return clear, well-defined echoes to the ultrasound transducer. So as a result, fluid-filled structures are easily visualized in ultrasound imaging. Now, have you ever wondered the physics behind why we instruct a patient to have a full bladder before a pelvic ultrasound? It's because the fluid in the bladder acts as an acoustic window, enhancing the visualization of nearby structures, such as the uterus and ovaries. Now, bone has very high attenuation rates in ultrasound imaging due to its dense and rigid structure. Unlike soft tissue or fluid, which allows sound waves to pass through with ease, bone reflects and absorbs a significant portion of the sound waves that encounter it. Now, this is why ultrasound isn't a good choice for imaging bone structures. In conclusion, different mediums have varying rates of attenuation in ultrasound imaging. Water has an extremely low attenuation rate, followed by fats and biologic fluids like blood and urine, which also have low rates. Soft tissue falls somewhere in the middle, with muscle attenuating slightly higher than soft tissue. And moving to denser tissues, bone and lung have much higher attenuation rates. And finally, air has an extremely high rate of attenuation. It's important for you to be aware of these differences in attenuation rates for different media. Understanding how sound waves interact with various tissues and mediums is crucial for optimizing imaging and interpreting diagnostic images accurately. Now let's talk about impedance. Impedance is the resistance encountered by sound waves as they travel from one medium to another with different acoustic properties. Think of it like driving a car from a smooth road onto a rough road. As the car transitions between the two surfaces, it encounters resistance and may experience a change in speed or direction. Similarly, when sound waves encounter boundaries between different tissues or mediums in the body, they experience changes in impedance. Now, impedance is influenced by two key factors, the density of the medium and the speed at which sound travels within it. Density plays a significant role in impedance because it determines how closely packed the particles or molecules are within the medium. A denser medium, such as bone, has more particles per unit volume, resulting in a higher impedance. And a less dense medium, such as air, has fewer particles per unit volume, leading to lower impedance. Now, the speed of sound in a medium also affects impedance. The higher the speed, the higher the impedance. So, in summary, impedance is directly related to the density of a medium and the speed at which sound travels within it.
Now, refraction is a fascinating phenomenon in ultrasound imaging that occurs when sound waves change direction as they pass from one medium to another. To understand refraction, let's use the classic example of a pencil in water. When you place a pencil in a glass of water, it appears bent at the point where it enters the water. This occurs because light waves change direction as they pass from air, a less dense medium, into the water, a denser medium. This bending of light waves is what is known as refraction. Similarly, in ultrasound imaging, sound waves can bend or change direction when they encounter boundaries between two tissues or mediums with different acoustic properties. However, for refraction to occur, two specific conditions must be satisfied. Firstly, the sound waves must strike the boundary at an oblique angle, meaning that they approach the boundary at an angle other than perpendicular or 90 degrees. And secondly, the two mediums on either side of the boundary must have different propagation speeds. So when these conditions are met, refraction occurs, causing the sound waves to bend or change direction at the boundary between the two mediums. And that wraps up our lesson of how sound interacts with different media in ultrasound imaging. As sonographers, it's crucial to be mindful of these interactions so that we can enhance our imaging techniques and provide better patient care. Stay tuned for our next lesson where we will cover transducers. Until then, keep learning and keep scanning. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you like this educational content and you think that it's helping you, make sure to like and comment on this video as well as subscribe to my channel. I'll see you guys next time.